so much for joining us today. Ed Perkins is the director of The Princess, uh, a new documentary for HBO Films, which takes a really remarkable approach to the life and the, the media life of Princess Diana from the time that we first saw her being introduced to the public around 1980, early 1981, through the royal wedding and all the way up through her death in 1997. This film was told entirely through archive footage, actual media footage of her life and these events. Uh, there are no talking heads, no interviewees, no voiceover. Ed, what made you settle on this particular approach for telling the story that we all know so well? I should first say, I've been wanting to make this film for a very long time. It's, it's a bit of a diversion from some of the stories we've previously taken on, but I've always felt passionately that this is one of the kind of defining stories of our, of our era, really. And it's a story that a lot of us lived through and I think kind of actively participated in. And it kind of has it all. It's got tragedy, love, betrayal, revenge. And it does feel a bit like a sort of Shakespearean saga. Um, and I also kind of, the reason I first came to this story was, or decided to make the film was, I had a sort of personal relationship with it in as much as like a lot of people when I was 11 you know I was 11 when Diana died and I remember very very vividly the moment I heard that she died and I had a sort of strange reaction because my parents were very emotional very emotional and I remember turning the tv on and kind of looking at tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of people taking to the streets of London and crying kind of uncontrollably really. And there was this sort of wave of national grief and emotion that I don't think I'd ever seen and I don't think I've ever seen since. And if I'm totally honest, my reaction as an 11 year old wasn't to be sad, it was kind of to be confused. And I couldn't quite work out why people were emoting in the way that they were about a person that most of us had never met. And it did confuse me. And I guess I was trying to work out, you know, what was it the, the, you know, what was the connection that the world had with this person and, and why did they seem to care so much? So that was really the starting point for the film was how do we construct a film in which by the end of the film, when Diana does sadly die and we see those extraordinary scenes in the week after her death, we may have a better understanding with perhaps a, a greater emotional clarity about what happened and, and why. Because this was a life lived entirely in front of the media. You know, this one of the most well-documented lives ever. And it's interesting. I, I think, you know, you said a little bit in, in your statement for the film that, you know, a lot of recent portrayals of Princess Diana have been very interior. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you were opting for a different approach. What perspective were, are you hoping that viewers take away here that they may not have gotten before? I think really, you know, I'm very aware that this story has been told very widely before. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that this is one of the most widely told stories across the sort of storytelling genres ever. And, and the challenge clearly from day one was how do we, you know, that it's only worth doing something um, if we feel like we have something new to say and can offer up a different perspective. And I felt very strongly that the perspective that hadn't really been explored before was not necessarily trying to get inside Diana's head. You know, a lot of the films have been quite interior. They've tried, I think, with, you know, with great success often to get inside her head, to understand her psychology, to pick apart the, in a granular way that the, the breakdown of the marriage. You know, I wanted to try to do something different. The question that really interested me was, what does this story tell us about ourselves? And really that informed our decision to be archive only, um, you know, to live with contemporaneous archive because, in doing so, by eschewing kind of retrospective hindsight analysis, I think it allows us to stay in the moment, you know, and, and the story unfolds in the present tense as though it's happening in the present tense. And what excited me as we started to get into the process was that that allowed us, I think, in places to turn the camera back onto all of us and ask those interesting and I think kind of largely unanswered questions um, about all of us. You know, what is our relationship to not just monarchy, but what is our relationship to celebrity and what is our, what was our role and perhaps what was our complicity in this tragic tale? Yeah, because the, the footage is so extraordinary that you include throughout. There is a kind of religious fervor almost that these masses of humanity, you know, greet Diana with, whether in person, you know, and, and on her various tours, or certainly then at, at, upon her death, when people felt that almost they had to make a, a, a pilgrimage to Buckingham yeah. Palace, to Kensington Palace, to lay flowers, you know, in, in honor of her memory. Yeah. Um, it's, it's such a singular thing. I, I was in watching your film, I was thinking, 
who else really has evoked that level of, of an intense reaction? And I, I can't quite place it because it's easy to say like, oh, this anticipates reality TV or a lot of these other things. But I don't know. In a way, Diana feels singular to me. What do you think? I think that's probably fair. And I, you know, I spent a lot of time over the last two years trying to work out exactly what it was that happened in those that week, especially after she died. I, I don't think there's a simple answer. And I hope that our film doesn't try to offer up, offer up a simple explanation for what's what's happening there. You know, I've obviously done a lot of reading and, and research interviews with people that knew her. I think there is something, there's a combination of her beauty and her vulnerability, which I think was extraordinarily powerful. Um, and, you know, I probably watched more archive at this point of Diana than possibly anyone else alive you know we 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 had to go through hundreds and thousands of hours of footage and i came away feeling something kind of interesting which that diana was both more ordinary and more extraordinary than i had perhaps thought at the beginning of the process she was more ordinary in the best way possible which was that she was human and fallible and was willing to make mistakes you know in public and and there was something about that vulnerability and that willingness to make or that ability to make mistakes um that i think was very disarming for people. She was also extraordinary. And I think a lot of people who are perhaps skeptical to this story perhaps don't give her this credit. And I feel very strongly from watching footage of her going to hospices, spending time with kids, she does have this extraordinary ability to walk into a room and put people at ease. And it's kind of a soft skill, but it's a very real skill in the real world. And she clearly did have an amazing, extraordinary ability to make people feel comfortable around her, despite the fact that she was a princess. And, you know, there are times in her life when she put herself, um, you know, in, in, in causes, you know, whether it was AIDS or, or um, um, mines in Angola, uh, landmines in Angola, she really did have an enormous impact on the world, a positive impact on the world. And so, yeah, I, I've come out by thinking she was more ordinary and more extraordinary than I perhaps uh, got into the process thinking. I also felt like you, emphasize footage that isn't seen quite as much. Yeah. Um, for instance, you have that famous press conference interview with Diana and Charles, where she's wearing her beautiful ring right before they get married. And uh, he has that famous answer when asked like, well, of course you're in love or whatever. And he's like, whatever love means. One of the great, you know, cringe TV moments of all time. You didn't include that moment. That's no, we've really, we've really tried throughout this whole story to not include the moments that everyone has already seen many, many times over the years. And I, you know, I give a huge amount of credit to our incredible editor, uh, Jinx Godfrey, for, for really pushing this idea. We aren't trying to kind of tell Diana's story in a granular, micro way. That's not the purpose of this film. There's lots of other film, lots of other series, lots of other books and podcasts that do that. We're trying to do something quite different, which is... Yes, to explore Diana, but also, as you say, to explore the relationship between us and the royal family and Diana through, you know, as mediated by the, by, by the press. And so we made a conscious decision not to go for those moments that we've seen over and over again. So, as you say, the, the famous moment where Charles says whatever love means. There's other moments throughout. There's a famous moment where she was confronted on the ski slopes and she put her hand in front of a camera lens. It's something, again, we've seen. We're trying to allow space in the film for audiences to bring their own hindsight to bear on this story. And so the process of making this film was to try to kind of break it down into as few parts as possible and leave space for audiences who have probably watched or read or just by osmosis taken in this story over the past 25, 30 years and allow them to, to fill in the gaps and bring their own hindsight to bear. And I suspect, hopefully, this film is a film that starts a conversation, but it's also probably a film that everyone because they bring their own emotional baggage you know their own feelings of diana into this they will also hopefully come out with 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 a different reaction and a different um response to to the film i'm curious how you source some of the footage there's a remarkable moment so on the the night of august 30th uh, 1997 when the news first came that diana was in this horrible car accident you know i'm exactly like you ed i'm 11 i was 11 years old at the time we're the same age uh, and I remember the way that night unfolded so clearly. So you, you were in the UK probably. So obviously it was much later in, in the evening when all of this happened. But stateside, we first found out that she had been in a car accident around 7.30, 8 p.m., I'd say, um, at night. And it did not seem like it was that serious at first. 
And that's reflected in this footage that you got of these guys sitting around playing the card game Uno, listening to the news coverage, kind of joking about it. And then the horrible news comes that she had died. And that was like hours into the coverage at that point. But how did you find that particular footage? Yeah, it's a great bit of footage. It sort of fast becomes some of the favorite footage. When we started this project, we kind of went in with the intention of trying to find or unearth a sort of secret treasure trove of archive about Diana, of Diana that no one had ever seen. The truth is that this story has been passed over so many times by different filmmaking companies over the years that it's very, it's almost, I would say, impossible to find totally new footage. We have an amazing archive team who scoured the globe trying to find everything. That specific clip actually uh, was found by, by one of our brilliant researchers on, uh, I think, her first day on the film, and she found it on YouTube. And I think it's been sitting on YouTube for a long, long time. And when we saw it, it kind of blew us away because it offers a totally different perspective and a way, a totally different way of telling that part of the story. You know, often that part of the story is told through, you know, the um, the news reports. You know, the, the 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 news being broken on TV, and here you're thrown into a, a, a world with these men who are playing Uno and are having a nice night together. And in the background, they're watching the news unfold. And as you say, at the start of that footage, it seems like it's not very serious and Diana's possibly hurt, but has walked away unscathed. And you see their reactions change. And I think I just found it very emotional because I think people will relate to that and it'll take them back to that moment in their lives. And there is something very, you know, it's, it's possibly like, like that JFK moment or 9-11, there are these moments that happen that sort of are seared in all our kind of collective memories. And we really do remember exactly where we were, who we were with, you know, what was happening in our lives at that day. And yeah, for me, and I think for a lot of people around the world, um, the very sad death of Diana was, was that such a moment. You're my age. Uh, you were 11 when, when she died. And yeah, I was profoundly affected by her, her death at the time, largely because my mom was such an admirer. Of, of Princess Diana, but like you, I was also just so taken aback by the, the overwhelming outpouring of grief and, and emotion. Over the years, you know, it's, this will be the 25th anniversary of her death at the end of this August here in 2022. And what does your relationship continue to be thinking about Diana, you know, in the 25 years since? Is this something that, you know, you'd always wanted to make this film? Is this something that, you know, just developed over time? Maybe there, there were long stretches where you weren't thinking about it, but maybe you came back to it. How did the, the sort of, how did your relationship with Diana and her memory and this remarkable legacy kind of ebb and flow over time? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, it, it's certainly not something, it's a film that Simon Chin, the producer, and I have been talking about probably for four or five years on and off, but it never quite felt like the right time to, to make it. It's not that I haven't been thinking of Diana solidly for the last 10 years while I've been a filmmaker trying to find the right moment. I think I think what perhaps swayed me in the last kind of 18 months is, you know, yes, we are reaching a period 24, you know, we're, 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 it's the 25th anniversary of her death this year. And yet still she's on the front pages of our newspapers every month in the UK. And that I remember just kind of reading endlessly every month, more and more articles and just thinking, what is happening here? Why as a country, why are people around the world still so absorbed by this story? And part of me wondered whether there was something kind of unresolved, you know, that, that we haven't kind of processed our role in, in what happened. And that's why this continuing conversation was happening. Clearly also there are echoes of what happened in Diana's story um, that are happening more recently. Um, you know, I think there are echoes between Meghan and Harry, and, and, and clearly when you watch the, the Diana Panorama interview, there are, I think, interesting parallels to um, what Meghan said when she sat down and spoke with, with Oprah Winfrey. And I think it just felt like an interesting time to, to re-explore this and, and to kind of bring it afresh to a modern audience. But, you know, and we're not the, we can't be the judge of this, but we, we did feel as though we had a new perspective. We didn't just want to make yet another Diana dog. We're very aware that you know, the world is, is kind of saturated with, with those. And, and, and I guess, perhaps naively, but I felt like we had something fresh to bring to the table through this different perspective. Not only the form, which is archive only, but the fact that that form allowed us to turn the camera back onto all of us and ask those questions about all of us and our complicity. And that, that is the most interesting thing for me. I think some of the most interesting moments are just the little bits of like sort of uh, the, the Vox Pop moments where you'll have uh, 
a young woman at the time talk about whether she hopes that Diana's baby will be a boy or a girl. And, you know, it says so much about patriarchy and our views on gender and just what and how all of these major issues can really be boiled down to one's relationship with one person, I think. I mean, the fact that uh, the announcement of Prince William's birth was actually announced, it was announced like on the loudspeaker system at grocery stores throughout the Yeah, that was a real find. I don't know where, quite where that, that came from, but I remember I spent the first sort of six, seven, eight months of this project just every day watching archive, you know, from the beginning of the day to the end of the day, I would just watch raw, you know, rushes. And sometimes you sort of got to sort of three o'clock in the afternoon and thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to call it a day. I'm not going to find that needle in a haystack moment that's really going to make it into the film. And then something like that would pop up and you think I've got to keep going. I've got to obsessively keep going to make sure I don't miss too much here. Uh, but it really was a process of trying to find those little golden nuggets, those little needle in a haystack moments that we could then build the film around and structure the film through. Um, so yeah, that is that is definitely one of our moments. But all of those those voices and the box pops, that was something that came a little bit later. So the process really was get all the archive. I then kind of cut select. So I would find moments that I felt were interesting or unusual or distinctive. And I would give those selects to our edit team and they would start to construct scenes out of them. Um, and you're then the first pass on the film really is, can we just tell the story? Can we get from plot point A to plot point B to plot point C coherently? Is there kind of narrative clarity? And we sort of did that and it sort of made sense. And we thought, brilliant, we've kind of cracked it. But actually we realized that was just the very start of the process. And, and you then, yes, you have a story that makes sense narratively, but you have to build into that nuance and layers and complexity. And we sort of came across this idea of, trying to kind of introduce almost like our Greek chorus, you know, so we would, we would lean into people on the street, you know, these Vox Pops or these daytime chat shows where people would, would be talking endlessly about Diana or, or, or the, you know, her story or the marriage. And we sort of leaned into those occasionally. So you had these little moments of vignettes where you're hearing from the people and they add intrigue and drama, but also can kind of um, offer analysis. You know, we're not just telling the story, we're actually hearing strong perspective and views. And I wanted to sort of bring to life that conversation, that constant national debate, international debate that was happening, you know, on kitchen tables and in pubs across the nation over those, you know, two decades. Well, it's just remarkable. And in the end, having all those box pops and all those different perspectives, sort of as the Greek chorus, as you said, yeah, it really does make you know, your film be as much about us as, as it is about Diana herself. And I think that's so fascinating. And it is a perspective I haven't seen before. To close things out, you know, you're a filmmaker, you've, you've made a number of documentaries now, you know, you see how Diana was able to bring people together in such a remarkable way that, you know, especially upon her death, people all around the world, you know, uh, mourned, came together, showed, you know, regardless of race or religion or ethnic background, nationality, one of the things that we're really trying to emphasize the Sundance is, you know, just the power of movies to do something similar. And obviously, you know, you're a filmmaker, you've recognized that power. Um, what's, what's an example from your own life of a movie being able to bring people together in a similar way, being able to connect communities and, and people in a very powerful emotional way? This isn't going to be a, probably the answer you want. I can, I can tell you, I can give you an example of a film that totally changed me and a lot of my colleagues at university and made us go into the industry, um, which was a film called Man and Wire, which Simon, the producer, produced. And I was, it's been such a privilege to work with Jinx Godfrey, our editor, because she cut that film, um, directed by James Marsh. That was a movie that blew me away, partly because of the story, but also because it was the first documentary I'd filmed, film I'd seen that kind of like felt like a drama and it didn't feel like it was in a different space. And I'm really interested in that. And I remember a group of us at university watching that film and kind of leaving thinking that's what we'd like to do. Um, I mean, again, this, this is a project that the, co the company I worked with made a few years ago, but there's a beautiful film called LA 92 about the LA riots, which again, I found, I watched a screening of that recently, quite recently in London, and that definitely felt like a, an experience for everyone in the room, you know, a, an ability to take us back into a very specific moment in time and really to, to relive it, but not just to relive it for the sake of reliving it, but to be able to see it afresh by the way that it had been packaged. So, yeah, I, like, I feel very strongly that movies can do that. I guess part of the sadness of not being able to all be together now is that 
the hope with this film in particular is that it would start a conversation, you know, in person and that we would hear people's opinions, probably strong opinions, both positive and negative, possibly about our film, but also about the royal family and our relationship to the royal family. And, you know, I hope that there's a way over the next few days and, and the coming months when this film goes out into the world that we can find a way to kind of have a, um, a collective conversation around some of the issues this film brings up, because I think that is, that is the kind of magic of cinema when you can watch it in a dark room with other people and you can share something together and it can spark conversations that, that, that make us look at ourselves and question ourselves. And yeah, fingers crossed we can do that. Uh, it's beautifully said. Ed, thank you so much. Uh, I am so eager for more people to see The Princess and for those conversations to happen. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.